This one just jumped out at me. The history of paganism. And I'm going, okay, I recognize them symbols. Um, and it says, at, you'll be able to hear where I got the title. From the gods of the ancients to the new religions of today. And trust me, G, uh, Solomon said, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. There is no new religion. There is no new doctrine. It's all the same stuff that God told the Israelites. Don't learn it from the Canaanites, from the Babylonians. Don't learn their, don't learn their religion. Don't find out how they worship their gods because you'll like it too much. You'll get into it and you will come on in. This is I see ya. That's how you say it. And Misha, right? And let's see, let me Daffy Duck. Right? No? What is it? Empress. Oh, I like that. Yeah. They from Atlanta, mama. She just came back from there. My mom said it's hot down there. It is hot down there. But anyway, uh, the same religion that was practiced thousands of years ago is the same religion that are... You, if you go back to California in the 50s and the 60s, and there was... California's been weird forever. There was an explosion, yeah, an explosion of New Age philosophies and cults in California, especially Los Angeles, Holly Weird. Um, who remembers the lady that played Della Street on Perry Mason? Remember her? Real sweet, typical, looks like a typical middle class American woman, okay, secretary type style. Um, she had been so influenced by Hollywood that she actually was a member of, let's see, what's called the Baha'i faith, which is a, a, an Indian, sort of a branch off Hinduism, if I remember right. But it basically is you're into meditation, emptying your mind, and you're channeling these gods. You are connecting through yoga or through meditation or whatever. You are channeling the gods. What that term literally is in the Bible is you are seeking a familiar spirit. And that was her faith all the way up until the day she died. And uh, I'm reasonably sure that if you find her headstone, they'll probably have it online somewhere. You won't see a Christian cross on there. She was a thousand miles away from that. Okay, and You wouldn't think that. Just seeing it, just watching her on television. Typical American middle-class Christian looking type person but no she was a weirdo her faith was weird and that's how it is in Hollywood and it's and it, then it spreads out and you have literally and I'm gonna say this literally Christian families losing their children over to these religions Witchcraft, paganism, you name it. It's out there, and the children are being indoctrinated in it. They're being influenced by other children, especially, take it however you want to, I'm going to say it, especially the young ladies. Young teenage girls are more at risk for buying into false religions than probably any other group in America. That's why if you go to any bookstore, go to the go to the children and teen section of any big bookstore and take a look at the books that are being marketed and sold to adolescents and early teens. 
all of them practically deal with witchcraft, wizardry, sorcery, magic, alien gods. Um, one book, my boyfriend, my boyfriend's an alien, which was also a Katy Perry song. Uh, Katy Perry, who has influence on young adolescent girls, sings not only My Boyfriend's an Alien, but then the other one, I Kissed a Girl and I Liked It. So our children are learning things outside of the Sunday school class and the church service, things that you probably are not aware of. And it's all building up to something, okay? I felt my nose Friday. If you see a little red spot there, and I noticed Friday, George, I had a little had a little bump there, and I'm going. I think I'm getting a pimple. I ain't had a pimple there since I was 13. And sure enough, last night I went in the bathroom, and there's there's already come to a head. And that's the illustration I'm using for what's happening right now. The pimples forming. It has an end result. It's going to come to a head one of these days and there is going to be an explosion. A day that I believe 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 calls the day when God sends strong delusion and they shall believe a lie. So let's get back to Revelation chapter 6 because I think this is a very relevant part of it. <clears throat> Let's just read part of this. Uh, verse 12, when I beheld, he had opened the sixth seal. And we're going to eventually look into the number six because we'll see that it goes along with it. And lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. And let me, let me just stop here again. Who remembers... All the videos and books and the hype about the four blood moons. What, what happened with... I see it. What happened with all that? Nothing. And I got criticized. Because I said... I said it publicly. I said it online. I said it to people that I know. Because they would ask me about it. And I'm going... I'm not worried a bit about it. And they said, oh, but it's, it's, it's going to fulfill Bible prophecy. No, no, it ain't. Because there was, there was a series of what we call blood moons or red moons. And how that happens is, it's like the opposite of, who remembers the, I'm forgetting my words. The thing we had in 2017 where the moon came in front of the sun. Eclipse. Yeah, it's the opposite of a solar eclipse. In a solar eclipse, the moon comes between the sun and the earth. Isn't it amazing that God made the moon the exact same size as the sun from that distance? Exactly. The Apollo uh, 11 astronauts were filming it as they were going around the moon and they were going, you ought to see this in three dimensions. You ought to see an eclipse, the, the moon eclipse the sun the way we're seeing it. It is out, they, they said it just adds another dimension to it. But anyway, the lunar eclipse is when the earth comes between the sun and the moon and blocks the sunlight going to the moon, which reflects the earth. And because of the various contaminants in our air, the sunlight going through the earth's atmosphere, shining to the moon, gives it a red hue. Now, look back at your Bible here. Look here at this verse. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. We would call that a solar eclipse. And then the moon became as blood. We call that a lunar eclipse. But here's the problem. It is impossible to have a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse at the same time. Because with one, the moon is between the sun and the earth. With the other, the earth is between the sun and the moon. You cannot have a... This is not a normal astrological or astronomical event. It's not an eclipse of some kind. And that's what... That's where 
all these idiots who wrote these books made millions of dollars off of their books, their videos, their TV shows, their podcasts, and everything else, lied through their teeth to make this into something that it never, ever was. And I knew it. I knew from the Bible that they were wrong. But these same people now, they're still selling books. They're still on TV. They're still making videos. They're still making millions of dollars. And nobody apparently has called them out on being false prophets. And they've never come out, to my knowledge, and said, well, we blew that one. We got that wrong. And they probably never will. Now, <clears throat> which is, my point in this is, it's just better to stick with your Bible. Believe what it says. So, verse 13 is what I wanted to focus on. The stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So, I was thinking about that this morning, last night, uh, yesterday, doing my study, getting ready for today. And I'm, and I'm going, my biggest question as a young man was, how do the stars fall to the earth? Well, let's, let's see what these stars are all right uh first go to the book of job if you would <clears throat> and let's see here i'm going to do something very quickly i'm going to pull up a can of king james here and we'll get to that and we'll do that and we'll type if you have a search program on your phone or the laptop you're watching on or wherever type that phrase in sons of God and uh, <clears throat> notice in Job let me turn there let me go here on on this here let's put it up on the screen because that's what JR is doing upstairs Job chapter 1 verse 5 and so it was when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job uh, oh verse 6 now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. So who were these sons of God? We'll find out in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> and Satan came also among them. Uh, now I get, I get accused a lot because of what I believe. I believe these sons of God were angels. And one of their reactions to that is is to accuse me of believing that satan is like jesus a son of god well notice here in job that the bible separates the two the sons of god and satan came also among them you will not find in my opinion a place in the bible that refers to satan as a son of God or the son of God or one of the sons of God okay so that answers that now go to chapter 2 verse 1 you're gonna see the same thing again we're gonna identify these sons of God again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them again the same thing Satan is differentiated from the rest of these who are angels now where do I get that they are angels turn to Job 38 <clears throat> Job 38 and if we look at verse 1 we'll get the big context of verse 8 uh, Job has laid out his complaint before the Lord uh, or his mourning his lamentation before the Lord I wouldn't necessarily call it a complaint but who among us, if we get afflicted, and I don't think any of us have been afflicted the way Job was, but who among us, when we get afflicted, do not at least cry out to the Lord? And yet you have some people say, well, you should be happy all the time in the Lord, no matter what. No. No, read the Bible, read Psalms. I cried before the Lord. Why did he cry before the Lord? Because there was, he was in deep 
lamentation. He was in woe. Those things happen to us, and it's fake to go around smiling all the time, putting up a front that's not real. It's fake. And I don't like fake. Um, so the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, and he says, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. And he's going to ask Job a series of rhetorical questions. And verse 4 is, Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Now, Job really doesn't have to answer, because the answer is, Job would say, I wasn't there. In other words, Job, did you help me lay out the foundations of the earth? Was you there when I did that? No. Job, um, verse 5, Job, who laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? In other words, we know that the earth is laid out and we have coordinates. It's a ball, so it has 360 degrees, right? Every circle has 360 degrees, and this is how people have navigated the earth for centuries, is they use the best clocks they could come up with, with the position of the stars, and that would give them latitude and longitude. We still do it that way, exactly that way. God is the one who stretched the lines and put the measures on the earth. It's just like, who invented the tape measure? God did. He invented a way to measure everything. Uh, then he gets down, verse 8, who shut up the sea with doors? When it break for, he's talking about the flood, as if it issued out of a womb. In other words, when the floods were going, who stopped the water from flowing after 40 days? God did. Man didn't do that. Man was no part of it. And then he said, um, let me go back to verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? Who's the cornerstone? Christ. He's the foundation, the cornerstone of everything. And then he said, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And this verse is telling you that the sons of God are the stars. That's what they are. And by the way, we know this now. It's almost like we live in an age where we go, duh, didn't everybody know that? We know now, Cubby, that every star that all of the astronomers in the world and astrophysicists can spot and see and measure and name and everything else, we know that every one of those stars emits its own frequency. Go on YouTube, go online somewhere and find, uh, I can't remember what it would be called, but they took the frequency that comes from all the planets in our solar system and they ran it through a computer and then synthesized it to where like a musical tone would come out and it actually plays its own musical tones. Every planet has its own different part in the chorus of the stars. And we didn't know that until the latter half of the 20th century. But God did because he's the one that causes the morning stars to sing together and the sons of God shout for joy. God knew that. Amen? This Bible's right. Uh, turn to Psalm 82. I'll give you another one. This is basically defining what the stars are according to the Bible. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. We have a star where we are now on earth. It's out there now, and it's called the sun. In Spanish, it's el sol. Um, 
In French, it's soleil. Um, Greek, it's helios. That's where we get the word helium from. But our star, the sun, is who? In the Bible. It's Christ. He is the son of righteousness in Micah, or Malachi. He rises with healing in his wings. In Matthew chapter 17, when he was transfigured, his face shone as the sun. In Revelation chapter 1, when John heard his voice, he turned around and looked, said his countenance was shining as the sun. Uh, so Christ uh, is the bridegroom in Psalm chapter 19. The, ta the, the heavens are a tabernacle, the Bible says, in Psalm 19. We'll turn there in a minute. And, uh, but anyway, in Psalm 82, God said in verse 6, I have said, ye are gods, and all of ye are children of the Most High. So the angels are the children of the Most High God, the sons of God. Okay, uh, let's see here. I mentioned Psalm 19, so let's go to Psalm 19. I'm just taking you on a little journey through the Bible. And we're kind of finding out who the stars are. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show this handiwork. Well, how do the heavens declare the glory of God? Let's stop and think. I, 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 stopped, I was at John Uter's house. <clears throat> And I was reclining in his living room recliner. <clears throat> and I sat straight up. And I went, because oh. it occurred to me, I've been pondering this for years. How did the heavens declare the glory of God? Well, it dawned on me that in Luke chapter 2, the shepherds were abiding in their fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And what happened after that? And lo, the angel of the Lord, um, no. Lo, the, well, I better look at it. Luke chapter 2, turn there. I used to have this memorized. Yeah. And lo, the angel of the Lord, I was right. Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. What, are the, what is the heavenly host? It's the stars. Praising God and saying what? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to, toward men. When you go back to, to, to Psalm 19, that is exactly what David said they would be saying. Psalm 19. So the angels of God showed up to the shepherds there outside of Bethlehem, and proclaim the glory of God. And in Psalm 19, the heavens declare what? The glory of God. I love this. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Is there any place on the earth where you can't see the sun, moon, and the stars? No! It's universe, it's all over, no matter what language you speak, God's showing you the cross. He's showing you Calvary. He's showing you his son, Jesus Christ. Whew. And then it says, verse 4, their line has gone, through, has gone out through all the earth. You know what a line is? It's what I'm reading. Like if you were in a play, you were gonna, you're going to speak your lines. I tried out for... Drama when I was in high school and uh, auditioned along with the other kids. I come home, my mom says, well, how'd you do, son? I said, great. I said my lines faster than anybody else did. I got the part. That was a joke. I didn't really say that. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle. In them, the heavens, hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. 
Now, God told Moses to build a tabernacle down on the earth. And he specifically said, I want the entry to the tabernacle to be in the east. I want the most holy place to be in the west. And I don't care where you park, you're going to plan it that exact same way. And how hard is it to find the east at 7 o'clock in the morning? Easiest thing in the world. Go find the sun. That's east. So every time they moved the tabernacle, they set it back down. The door was facing east. The holy place, most holy place was in the west. And that's the way the sun goes. Rises in the east and goes down in the west. And the priest, the high priest, walks in on the day of atonement in the east. And he walks through and does his thing. He goes all the way to the end of the world, which is the most holy place. It's the very last part of the tabernacle. It's as far as you can go. And there Christ died and offered himself a sacrifice. The sun goes down. But what happened? He goes to the lower parts of the earth, doesn't he? And that's to us, that's what the sun's doing at night. It's going down below the ground, George, going to the lower parts of the earth. What happened three days later? Yeah, amen. Which is as he said, there, and he said, there are words to the end of the world. In them hath he said a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom. That's Christ coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. You know what that is? That's Jesus saying, I can beat you all. Okay, I'll whoop every one of you. I am not going to be looking at your backside crossing the finish line. You're going to be looking at mine. Amen. Amen. Oh, I love this stuff. Uh, stars. Go to judge. Yeah, judges. Go to judges. Are you going to make me do it? Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Look at this. This is um, the story of Sisera, and he had 900 chariots of iron. It's a prophecy. What time is it? Is it time for me to shut up? No, not yet. Um, and Deborah was the judge over Israel. Uh, Barak was her captain of the army. And when they win the battle, then Deborah... Uh, she sings a song along with Barak, and she mentions in here, I'll have to find it, the constellations. Yeah, verse 20. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Is there a war in heaven? Of course there is. I know the bell rang, but I got to finish this thought. Now turn to Revelation 12. I'm, I'm a lawyer in a courtroom, and I'm, I'm going to convince you that stars are angels. So in Revelation 12, and, and think about that song that Deborah sang. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Now, if you only believe in astrology and you only believe in the creation of the stars themselves, you think the stars in their courses direct your fate. But is that true? I was born on May 30th, which makes me a Gemini. But you know, I don't care. I don't care because my birth date does not determine my fate, my course in life, nothing. The stars don't tell me what to do. The creator of those stars directs my fate and my course. Amen? So there's a war in heaven. It's always a war in heaven until the end of everything. In verse uh, 4, this is about the, the great red dragon in verse 3. And verse 4, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. In my opinion, that is Revelation 6, the opening of the sixth seal. Those events are one and the same. 
uh, related to one another. The star, I don't believe there's two events of stars falling from heaven. I believe that there's one great big giant event where God shakes the heavens and the earth. And if you follow this up, verse 4, and go down to verse 7... There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels. It's giving you the context of the dragon casting the stars down to the earth. Verse 8, And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Boom. So the, this event, I believe, is related to to Revelation 6. Now, just to tidy this up, now shut up. What does that mean? Okay, I could spend an hour and just explain to you this symbol right here. I can show it to you in the Bible. It's in plain sight. I speak symbol. But the bottom line is, those gods are going to be cast down to this earth. And what are they going to do after that? They're not dead yet. They are going to take over this world. Take it over. And then they, and the dragon, and the beast, and the false prophet, are going to try one more battle. In the valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, to fight Christ and his ten thousands of his saints. But I already know who wins that one. Amen? Father, open our eyes to wondrous things that we behold out of thy law. We thank you, Lord, for your judgments, your statutes, your words. We thank you, God, for their preservation for us today. This this. This Bible is more valid now than at any other time. God, thank you again. Always thank you for your word opening our eyes and guiding us in these last days, helping us to fight the battle that we're fighting every day, not only for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our brothers and sisters, Father, help us keep standing and fighting in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.